Today I want to try to look at William Wordsworth as the quintessential English poet, the poet in whose work England comes alive, the poet whose work captures the spectacular natural beauty of England, especially the natural beauty of the Lake District, the poet who, whose efforts brought English poetry very close to everyday speech, everyday conversation, the poet whose work does not demand any special expertise for reading, for enjoyment, the poet who is read, who can be read, who is read by very ordinary schoolboys and enjoyed by them, the poet who went to Germany and felt terribly homesick for England, so homesick that he wrote the famous poem, I travelled among unknown men, I travelled among unknown men in lands beyond the sea, nor England did know till then what love I bore to thee. I travelled among unknown men, which captures the nostalgia that William Wordsworth felt when he was in Germany, the nostalgia for England that he felt when he was in Germany. Above all, the William Wordsworth is the poet who wrote Daffodils. I wandered lonely as a cloud. Daffodils, the best loved poem in the English language, the most iconic poem in the whole of English literature. If anybody can be called the ultimate English poet, it is certainly William Wordsworth. William Wordsworth was in the habit of taking long walks along with his sister Dorothy Wordsworth through the countryside and in 1802 the poet and his sister suddenly and unexpectedly came across a belt of daffodils on the banks of the glacial lake Ulswater. The impact of the vision the impact of the scene on both the poet and his sister was that of shock, excitement, thrill. And uh, it can even be said that there was a mystic element in that experience. That was in 1802. William Wordsworth did not write the poem immediately. However, Dorothy Wordsworth, who was a meticulous diarist, recorded in her journal the details of the experience. The poet discussed the experience repeatedly with his sister, even consulted the diary entry and at some two years later wrote the poem. The story is not complete because the poem underwent repeated revisions and as late as 1815 Revisions were being carried out and the poet's wife, Mary Hutchinson, contributed to the revision of the poem. Thus, it can be said that the entire family contributed to the creation of daffodils, which is technically known by its first line, I wandered lonely as a cloud. The creation of the poem is a perfect example of the operation of the dictum, of the, of the operation of the Wordsworthian dictum of emotion recollected in tranquility. The poem has two alternative titles. The first of these is the opening line of the poem itself. I wandered lonely as a cloud. The second is daffodils. Technically, the first option is better because the poet never bestowed any title on the poem. And to begin with, the poem was known through its first line, was identified through its first line 
which was used as a title. However, many anthologists and editors, many scholars compiling textbooks prefer the title Daffodils because it gives an immediate idea of what the poem is all about. And the poem is universally known among schoolboys to the title, to the secondary title, to the alternative title, Daffodils. I think the botanical name of the daffodil is Narcissus. Narcissus is a very common plant which grows in the wild in Europe, North America and some parts of North Africa. The daffodil is one of the very first flowers to bloom to bloom and the blooming of the daffodil signifies the arrival of spring. When you see a daffodil blooming it means that spring is around the corner. The daffodil is the national flower of Wales. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills. I don't think there is a schoolboy who does not know this opening line of the poem. I wandered lonely as a cloud. As I've already pointed out, the opening line is sometimes used as the title of the poem. I wandered lonely as a cloud. Critics have pointed out that it is very rare to come across a solitary cloud. I wandered lonely as a cloud. A cloud is almost never lonely. Then why has Wordsworth written, I wandered lonely as a cloud? Perhaps he thought of himself as a human being who was the rarest of the rare. He was spiritually inclined. In a world madly pursuing material possessions, he was fascinated by nature. He spent long hours, a substantial part of his life, observing nature, communing with nature. And so he thought of himself as a cloud which is solitary as a cloud which is, which is solitary, which means as a human being who is the rarest of the rare. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills. Vales are valleys. I think this is a favorite word of Wordsworth. You find it in the solitary reaper, the second last line, the first stanza, if I remember correctly veil profound that floats on high over rails and hills. So I think we can interpret the loneliness of the cloud not vis-a-vis -vis other clouds but vis-a-vis -vis the valleys and the hills. William Wordsworth had a passion for walking and for hours at a stretch he used to walk through the countryside and probably he saw himself something like a cloud, as a cloud. Just as the cloud is high over the valleys and the hills, just as the cloud is lonely vis-a-vis -vis the valley, valleys and the hills, the poet is lonely vis-a-vis -vis the world around him. He is far above the world in which human beings are madly pursuing material interests. He is far above the world in which human beings have 
no paramount passion except attaining material goals. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over wings and hills. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, when suddenly all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, host means large number, multitude, host can also mean army. In the Bible, God is sometimes called Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of armies. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, the most common color of the daffodil is yellow, golden yellow. The poet suddenly, unexpectedly comes across a huge number of daffodils. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host, a large number, a multitude of golden daffodils. Beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Beside the lake, by the side of the lake, beneath the trees, under the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. The flowers are fluttering, the flowers are dancing. Not for nothing do we say that William Wordsworth is the quintessential nature poet of the English language. See, in this stanza, the flowers, the cloud, the veils, the hills, the lake, the lake is Ull's water, the trees, the breeze, in fact, all the important elements of nature in Lake District are captured. This stanza successfully, powerfully captures all the important elements of the natural life of Lake District. I would like to pause for a moment and point out that the flower daffodil has fascinated artists down the centuries and that there are innumerable paintings presenting the flower. Perhaps the most famous of these is Bowl with Daffodils, Bowl with Daffodils by Vincent van Gogh. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. What a brilliant comparison. The Milky Way is the galaxy of which the solar system is part, of which the Earth is part, of which the Sun is part. We can see the Milky Way in the night sky as a band of light created by stars which cannot be distinguished individually by the naked eye, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. The comparison is between the daffodils, which are very close to one another, and the stars in the Milky Way which cannot be distinguished from one another through the naked eye. The brightness of the stars, the magical quality of the stars, the mystic quality of the stars are all made applicatory, are all applied to the daffodils. Thus we find what is very common in England, in the Lake District, is lifted to the realm of the uncommon, of the heavens. What is common on the earth is lifted to the realm of the heavens. Using this brilliant simile, 
in which a comparison is built between the daffodils and the stars that compose the Milky Way. They stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. The reference here is to Ullswater, the second largest lake in Lake District. I think the largest lake is Windermere. This is a glacial lake and on the banks of the lake, on the banks of the water body, the poet came across the daffodils that stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. Ten thousand. The poet has not counted the number of daffodils. He sees a large number of daffodils and he thinks there must be at least 10,000 flowers there. 10,000 saw I at a glance. At one glance, I think I have already pointed it out, the poet and his sister suddenly came across a vision, which was of course reality as well, of a large number of daffodils on the banks of a water body. 10,000 saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. Sprightly is energetic. They, it, it appears to the poet that they are shaking their heads, tossing their heads in an energetic dance, in a vigorous dance. We find the poet attempting to lift the earth to the heavens. The daffodil is a very common flower, a very common plant. It's found all over the Lake District. It is a national flower of Wales. It can even be said that it's of the earth, earthy. But the poet attempts to lift the earth to the heavens. First, using the opening line of the poem, I wandered lonely as a cloud. And now, by bringing in the Milky Way, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. A heavenly quality, a magical quality, is bestowed on the very common plant, on the very common flower, that is the daffodil. The waves beside them dance, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. Here a comparison and perhaps also a contrast is set up between the waves and the daffodils. The waves are the waves in Ulls water, the second largest lake in Lake District. It's a glacial lake. I think the the largest lake in Lake District is Winnemere. Woolswater is the second largest lake. It's almost uh, like a sea with waves, with ripples. And the poet says that the waves were dancing. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. It is as if there is a competition between the waves and the daffodils and it's a dancing competition and uh, the daffodils dance better more in a more energetic manner in a more sprightly manner than the waves a poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company jocund means jolly merry happy light-hearted cheerful a poet could not but be gay but be happy not uh, gay in a technical sense, but happy in such a jocund company. I think this is too much of a generalization. Uh, words, perhaps Wordsworth's awareness of English poetry was rather limited 
at least at this point, at the point of writing this poem, at the point of writing these lines. Because a poet like Dryden, a poet like Pope, would not be affected much by such a scene. This is not to say that Wordsworth was not aware of Dryden, not aware of Pope, but the awareness was not sharp enough while writing these lines, at the point of writing these lines. That is why he says, a poet, a poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. Probably he sees himself as the archetypal poet. And he thinks that Dryden and Pope are not poets at all. A poet like Wordsworth, a nature poet like Wordsworth, a romantic poet like Wordsworth, could not but be happy in such a cheerful company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. To gaze means to look steadily, intently, with admiration, with wonder, with pleasure, with surprise. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. At that point of time, the speaker was not aware of the wealth that he had earned, what wealth the show to me had brought. What wealth? Because he has obtained a treasure. He has obtained a very precious memory. He has obtained something which cannot be taken away from him. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. The speaker himself was not aware of the tremendous significance, of the overwhelming significance of the experience, because the experience granted him something which was precious, which would remain with him forever, which could not be taken away from him. What wealth the show to me had brought. We can relate this to the famous definition of poetry of Wordsworth as emotion recollected in tranquility. This memory is bound, was bound, but the poet was not aware of it. To haunt the poet repeatedly, giving him immense joy, immense pleasure, immense satisfaction, even immense ecstasy. In the English language, we have a very long and very rich tradition of flower poems. Discussing the entire tradition would demand an independent video, perhaps even a series of videos. Here I would like to draw your attention to some of the important flower poems in English. We have a wreath by George Herbert. The Flower That Smiles Today by P.B. Shelley. The Flower by Lord Tennyson. The Lent Lily by A. E. Houseman. Flower Gathering by Robert Frost. Tulips by Sylvia Plath, and of course, the poem under consideration, Daffodils, or I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, by William Wordsworth. For oft, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon the inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. The speaker says that when he lies in his couch, what is a couch? I think today we prefer the name sofa. Couch and sofa are not wholly interchangeable terms. A sofa is usually bigger than a couch. 
a sofa is placed in the living room rather than in an inner room. A couch can be seen as a smaller version, version of the sofa. When oft on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, vacant, no thoughts in his mind, pensive, deep, meditative, dreamily thoughtful, with a touch of sadness about it, they flash upon the inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. What is the inward eye? The poet seems to have an eye in his mind, and he sees the daffodils in all their glory, in all their physicality, with his inward eye. They are not really present in front of him. He does not see the flowers using his physical eye. He sees them with his inward eye. I think the poet has deliberately used the term inward eye in order to make it clear that the daffodils appear before him as really, as physically, as they appeared before him on the day on which he actually saw them. The only difference is that on that day he saw the flowers using his physical eye, today he sees the flowers using his inward eye. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. The thematic trajectory of the poem reaches its conclusion, which is also its climax. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Here there is a complete identification between the speaker and the daffodils. In the opening stanza, the speaker sees the daffodils using his physical eye. Now the speaker sees the daffodils using his inward eye. Not just that, the speaker starts dancing with the daffodils. There is a complete identification between the speaker and his vision, between the speaker and the flowers. I often tell my students, if you want to know what is romantic poetry, read I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth. It is the quintessential romantic poem. Why do we say that? What is the subject matter of the poem? Nature, not just the daffodils, but also the trees, the waves, the breeze, the cloud, the stars that compose the Milky Way. Nature, in a very comprehensive and profound manner, you can draw a contrast between their focus on nature in romantic poetry and a focus on man in neoclassical poetry. I think it was Alexander Pope who said, the proper study of mankind is man. What is the setting of the poem? The countryside, the open countryside, the spectacularly beautiful countryside of Lake District. Again, you can draw a contrast between London being the favorite setting of the neoclassical poets and the countryside being the setting, being the favorite setting of William Wordsworth of the Romantic poets. In Romantic poetry, we come across very ordinary people, like the solitary reaper, like the leech gatherer, 
And the speaker in this poem is a very ordinary person. He wanders aimlessly like a cloud. I wandered lonely as a cloud through the countryside. He is not a mover or a shaker. He is a very ordinary person. He is not a duke or an owl. He is not an aristocrat or an intellectual. In real life, William Wordsworth led a very ordinary life and for many decades it was a life of utter poverty. It is not merely the presentation of nature that we find in, that we find in romantic poetry. It is also the idealization of nature, the idolization of nature. Nature is presented at its best or even better as it even better than it really is and it is idolized it is loved it is worshipped we find in romantic poetry we find in daffodils not merely the presentation of nature but the idealization of nature and the idolization of nature I would like to work out a contrast between this approach to nature, this idealization of nature, this idolization of nature, and the approach to nature that is so memorably expressed in the long poem In Memoriam A.H.H. by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Nature red in tooth and claw. Nature red in tooth and claw. At the heart of romantic poetry is imagination. Neo neoclassical poetry is significantly cerebral. Imagination does not play a very significant role in neoclassical poetry. It's more cerebral than imaginative. But romantic poetry, if there is no imagination, there is no romantic poetry. And in this poem we have the inward eye. The inward eye is the eye of the imagination of the speaker, using which he sees the flowers, the daffodils, in all its physicality, in all its reality, in all its actuality, in all its richness. Thus, the poem under consideration highlights a very important element in romantic poetry, and that is imagination. Finally, romantic poetry is rooted in the personal experience of the poet. It was Wordsworth who saw the daffodils. It was the personal experience of the poet. The poem Every line of the poem, every word of the poem, every punctuation mark of the poem is authenticated by the profound personal experience of the poet. The, the individual speaker, the individual poet is the, is the ultimate source of poetry, is the ultimate source of all creativity when it comes to romantic poetry. If Wordsworth had not seen the daffodils, he would never have written the poem. Romantic poetry, including the poem under consideration, is based on the profound and overwhelming personal experience of the poet. The poem is noteworthy for its sharp and striking images. The images are drawn from nature. We have images of the daffodils, of course, the cloud, the valley, the hill, the water body, the lake, the bay, the waves, the trees, the breeze. In fact, if you put all the images together, the stars, the Milky Way, if you put all the images together, I think you can get a comprehensive picture of the spectacular natural beauty of England in general and the Lake District in 
particular. The daffodil is more accurately, more technically known as Narcissus. The daffodil is the flower which appears first before all the other flowers appear. And the blooming of the daffodil signifies the arrival of spring. When you see daffodils, you realize that spring is around the corner. Thus, the daffodil, the narcissus, symbolizes the arrival of spring, symbolizes rebirth, regeneration, the beginning of a great period of richness, even the beginning of a new life. I know that there can be objections if I try to find symbolic depth, depth in this poem, but I think that we can see the daffodils in the poem under consideration as symbolizing the arrival of spring, as symbolizing rebirth, regeneration, as symbolizing the beginning of a great, new, rich period in English literary history. The daffodils in this poem symbolize the rise of the romantic movement. They symbolize the beginning of a great career as a poet of William Wordsworth, the poet of course being William Wordsworth. They symbolize the opening of a great, rich, new chapter in English literary history. The poem is organized in four stanzas of six lines each. The lines are more or less of equal length. The diction is extremely simple. The language used in the poem is very close to ordinary conversational speech of the English countryside. There is hardly any word in the poem which a schoolboy will not recognize. The meter used is iambic tetrameter. This means that there are four feet in each line and each foot is an iamb. An iamb is a foot consisting of two syllables. The first is an unstressed syllable and the second is a stressed syllable. The rhyme scheme used is A, B, A, B, C, C. There are two striking similes in the poem. In fact, the poem opens with a very powerful simile. I wandered lonely as a cloud. We have discussed this line in some detail. The poet works out a comparison between himself and a cloud, and a lonely cloud. It may be said that a cloud is seldom lonely. You don't come across a single cloud in the sky. Very rarely do, it, do you find such a solitary cloud. But the poet's point probably is that the cloud is lonely, not vis-a-vis -vis other clouds, but vis-a-vis -vis the vales and the hills. The poet in real life, William Wordsworth in real life, had a passion for walking and he saw himself as an aimless wanderer, wandering all alone through the countryside of England, of the Lake District, unattached to the world around him, very different from other human beings who were passionate about material pursuits. And I think that it's a very appropriate simile, it's a very striking simile, it's a very powerful simile. The poet wandering aimlessly like a lonely cloud, high over 
the rails and the hills. The poet spiritually very much evolved, operating on a much higher plane when compared to other human beings. The second stanza also begins with a striking simile. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. Again, we have discussed these lines in some detail. The poet works out a comparison between the daffodil, the daffodils which are very common flowers, which are found all over the Lake District, and the stars that compose the Milky Way. The attempt is to lift the earth to the sky. The attempt is to bestow a magical quality to the common daffodil. The attempt is to lift the earth to the heavens. The attempt is to provide the ordinary daffodil with a mystic quality. I would like to wrap up the discussion by saying two things. First of all, I would like to invite you to relate a very famous passage from Tindana Lines to the poem under consideration, to the poem under discussion. In Tindana Lines, William Wordsworth says, I quote, Nature never did betray the heart that loved her. Unquote. I repeat, nature never did betray the heart that loved her. I would like to invite you to apply this passage to daffodils in general and to the concluding part of the poem in particular. Nature to Wordsworth was the ultimate source of comfort, of solace, of joy, of bliss. I would also like to invite your attention to a not so famous poem by the Indian poet Dhammares. I am not very sure whether Dhammares can be looked upon as an Indian poet, how far he can be looked upon as an Indian poet. Because in 1961 he renounced his Indian citizenship and even tore up his Indian passport on television in protest against what he called the Indian Army crossing the international border and conquering Goa, the land of his forefathers. However, later Dom Maurice was allowed to come to India. He lived the last part of his life in India and he was even awarded the Sahitya Academy Award. The title of the poem is Bells for William Wordsworth. Bells for William Wordsworth is a fitting reply to all those critics who attempt to trash William Wordsworth and his work. Let me try to remember the opening lines of the poem. Today they brought me a message, Wordsworth is dead. My God, I said, my God, I can hardly believe it. I have had the good fortune to listen to Dom Marais himself reciting this poem, or more exactly reading this poem, and holding his audience spellbound. Let me repeat the opening lines of the poem once again. Today they brought me a message, Wordsworth is dead. My God, I said, my God, I can hardly believe it." Unquote. 